the turnpike was like literally down the street. Oh, it's live. All right, we're going live in 10. And you're on. Good evening, everyone. This is Reverend Sherry Lupton with Reset on TCP Network. Welcome. Today's topic is on disparities in the healthcare field. We're going to discuss COVID-19. We have two phenomenal guests with us, Dr. Kimberly E. Walker, PhD, MTASCP, and Dr. Tamika Armwood. She is a nurse practitioner, a doctorate degree in nursing. Before we begin, I just want to shout out our sponsors for Reset, which is Legal Shield, Kimberly Robinson, WLAB, Internet Radio 107.3, The Rev, Pastor Louis A. Butcher Jr., Erica Dennison, Paparazzi Jewelry, and Elizabeth Guthridge, EAG Credit Solutions, LLC, helping to build your legacy. So please support our sponsors and remember to let them know that we sent you and we'll discuss more about our sponsors at the end of the show. So thank you again. And I would also recommend that you right now share with others, family and friends on uh, watch party to invite others in. And I really appreciate that. So what is reset? Reset means to change. Reset means to adjust. Reset means to shift, to transition, to transform, correct to a new position. We are refashioning ourselves. We dare to be unapologetic. We are Christ-centered. Therefore, we inspire, we encourage, and we empower. Our scripture today can be found in the Lord has declared let me back up. Our scripture today can be found in Jeremiah 17, 14, and it reads, the Lord has declared that he will restore me to health and heal my wounds. And I wonder, I would like to underscore, he will restore me to health and heal my wounds. Regardless what is going on in your life, believe the scriptures, the Lord has declared that he will restore me to health and heal my wounds that can be found in Jeremiah 17, 14. So Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come to you right now in Jesus' mighty name. We ask Lord that you will guide us and uh, direct us for this TCP uh, reset program, God. We are praying for our uh, friends and family and uh, loved ones down in Texas, Lord God, we ask that you heal our land, Father God, provide them with everything that we need. We are praying for those that uh, have been stricken with COVID-19, those that are in the hospital, uh, in nursing homes, incarcerated, in their homes, Lord God, heal our land, Lord God, heal our land. Amen. So I just want to thank my guest today, and my question is, well, it's not really a question. It's about everyone should have access to the vaccine. Everyone should have access to the vaccine. Our goal today is to inform you, is to inspire you and empower and encourage you to make sure communities mm -hmm. of color are not left behind, to make sure that your grandparents, your parents, people that you know that are not left behind. We know that disproportionately the black and brown communities are not being vaccinated. That should be your option. You should talk with your family members, talk with your doctor, but get the information. Lack of many of our people uh, lack uh, online internet services or low income or undeserved areas are falling short in communities of color. What can you do? This is what we could do. I need you to take notes. 
I need you to begin to advocate for your family and for your community, for your neighborhood. If each person would just ask within their neighborhood, therefore we are empowering each other. So questions, let your mother, let your father, let your grandparents know, let your great grandparents know and your community uh, how to get uh, vaccinated. So we know here, so the social justice issue is who's getting the vaccine. We know that disproportionately, our communities are not getting the vaccine. I live in Lancaster. So people that live in Lancaster, Lancaster General Hospital, there's COVID information for appointments and scheduling, you'll go online, www.lancastergeneralhealth.org, COVID-19 information. You can also, if you don't live in Lancaster, Department of Pennsylvania, COVID-19, find out if it's your turn. You can call 1-877-724-3258. Somebody write that down. 1-877-724-3258 or 1-877-Pennsylvania-HEALTH. Advocate again for your family and community. Take notes, talk to your parents, your grandparents and great-grandparents. Uh, great have them call your doctor if you have any questions. So where do we get um, vaccinated? We, I gave you the information for Lancaster. You can go on Pennsylvania Department of Health. We know that we just learned here in Lancaster that they're gonna open up Park City, the old Bonton, and that's gonna happen next month. So my question is why are some racial and ethnic minority groups disproportionately affected by COVID-19. I've seen on TV today that uh, in Florida, Governor DeSantis set up a vaccine clinic in two zip codes that are for the rich. He is now being accused of favoritism. So we have to look out for each other. Are we being ignored? What are disparities in the healthcare? Uh, we know that in Pennsylvania, the rollout is a little slow compared to other um, states. We know that the, vas uh, the rollout for the vaccination is a little slow. We know that Pennsylvania is going to employ National Guards to get uh, vaccines in residents' arms. We want them to distribute it effectively, efficiently, and equity. How does that happen? You must advocate. We know that the federal government will oversee a centralized system to order, distribute, and track COVID vaccines. How do we know that? We have to advocate for each other. All vaccines will be ordered through the CDC. Vaccine providers will receive vaccines from CDC centralized uh, distribution. So our centralized distribution is through Lancaster, uh, General Hospital. We know that in Dauphin County, we know that Rite Aid, uh, the pharmacy will begin uh, to give uh, vaccines. So what is healthcare disparities? Why should we even care? If I get my shot, I don't have to care about uh, another person, but we don't do that. Racial disparities uh, in healthcare. And we're gonna discuss this with our two distinguished guests today. Super smart sisters, I must say, yay. We have Dr. Tamika Armwood and we have Dr. Kimberly Walker. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so much. I appreciate you coming. So just to give you some information um, with uh, our guest, Dr. Kimberly E. Walker was trained as a clinical laboratory scientist, the people who test your blood in labs at the University of Maryland and worked in Allentown, Pennsylvania before returning to school to obtain a PhD in microbiology and immunology. Woo, <laughs> serious sister. And I didn't read everything because I didn't wanna stutter over some of those words, but I want you to explain it later on. And we also have Dr. Tamika Armwood. Dr. Tamika Armwood, has a doctorate degree in nursing. 
She um, became a registered nurse in 1998 through 2017. She, uh, 1996, um, Temple University College of Allied Health Professions, a bachelor's degree in science, cum laude, 2007, Widener School of Law, Legal Education Institute, legal nurse consultant. That was different, Dr. Tamika, um, of going uh, in, in that field. We'll have to talk more about that. Sure. 2016, Temple University College of Public Health, Doctor of Nursing Practice with a focus on family individuals across the lifespan, magna cum laude. Her dissertation was on effectiveness of improved health literacy on the effects of self-management of patients. You said that you're currently a legal nurse consultant, Philadelphia and Wilmington, Delaware. You work with attorneys with the emphasis on personal injury, medical malpractice, and products liability claims. So I just want to thank you, ladies. And I'm going to um, go back and forth to your, um, your bio and your resume. It was thorough what I have here for Dr. Kim, Assistant Professor of Medicine. Um, oh, my goodness. Federal Specialist. And also, you have written... Um, you are currently the program director for clinical laboratory program in Northeast Ohio. Dr. Walker has written several medical publications and holds several honors. Dr. Walker uh, holds certifications, awards, and professional societies, and it was an invited lecturer at Georgetown University. So I just want to thank you, uh, my dear Sister doctors, wow, wow. So I'm going to start this. I'm going to jump right in, start with Dr. Uh, Tamika Armwood. Dr. Armwood, could you tell us what is COVID-19? Sure. I just want to uh, first thank you, um, Reverend Sherry, for inviting me on, on your show tonight to be a part of this uh, most uh, important topic. So I'm just going to share my screen. Oh, let me hit share. So just briefly, just uh, speaking about uh, COVID-19. Uh, COVID, coronaviruses are a family, a large family of viruses, right? That usually cause mild to moderate um, upper respiratory tract infections, um, usually, um, such as the common cold. So we've already, um, it's, it's not a new thing, coronaviruses. It is like a form of the common cold. Um, SARS, the virus that actually causes coronavirus, um, is, a, is a severe acute respiratory syndrome. It was first identified in December of 2019 in Wuhan, Wuhan China. Um, there in, in China, um, there was an outbreak of this atypical pneumonia. Um, there in China, and it was later um, identified as a coronavirus. Okay, so um, could you show us a, um, do you have a slide showing us an example of uh, COVID? Sure. Okay. Uh. Yes. So there, this is a picture of um, a SARS, uh, a SARS virus. Um, do you want me to explain this, or Reverend? Uh, yes. Kim? Go ahead. So the coronavirus, I mean, the SARS uh, coronavirus is uh, this does a, a cell with a, a cell membrane um, denoted like in the purple there, um, and then like it has these uh, proteins called the spike proteins. And that's like the site of almost the site of entry. Um, we use, they use the site of entry, the spike protein as well, like an ACE inhibitor to kind of dock there and, that, and gain entry into the cell. It's not listed on this picture here, but inside the cell, we have a nucleus that houses your DNA, okay? Um, the vaccine, as we'll discuss later, does not penetrate that DNA, that nucleus of your cell. So I just wanted to show like this is, picture of the actual SARS virus. 
and that will come into play later on in our conversation. Okay. Thank okay, you. I'd like oh. to try to try to clear up two two little things that I think may be confusing to to all of our listeners. So COVID-19 is the name of the disease. Right. It is caused by SARS-CoV-2. So it's it's really important to understand that there are two different things. Mm -hmm. So um, in the case of something like Mm, measles. There's a different name for the measles uh, virus, but the disease that's caused is called measles. Same thing here. SARS-CoV-2 is the virus. COVID-19 is the disease. Exactly. Similar to HIV, you know, right. the human, you know, immunodeficiency right. virus is caused. So AIDS is actually a disease caused by the virus. The HIV virus itself causes disease. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. could can you go back to the the map of um, SARS-CoV-2? That 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 picture, sure. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about this is, this is a, a cartoon of what the actual SARS-CoV virus looks like. This is not an association with a cell yet. This is just mm -hmm. what the virus looks like by itself. So the blue in the center is the nucleic acid, which is RNA. Um, it's bound by a membrane and the spike glycoprotein is exactly as you said, that's, that's where it enters the, the human cell. That's a, basically a receptor. If you think about a lock and key, that protein is the, the key that gains entry into our cells. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's also the protein that your immune system recognizes. Once you've been infected, you will have lots of antibodies to the spike protein. What, what, could you explain that a little bit more? Um, okay, so anytime you encounter some foreign a virus, a fungus, a, a bacteria, your immune system, which is multifaceted, it has all kinds of proteins, it, does all kinds of activities, but typically there will be one or two or maybe three proteins that the immune system sees, recognizes, and produces proteins that knock out whatever the, the um, invading microbe is. And typically uh, it will only be a few, but your immune system will respond to them like gangbusters. Mm -hmm. So the spike protein is the thing that your immune system sees, makes antibodies to, and tries to clear the, the virus as well as the disease cells. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything to add, uh, Dr. Tamika? I do not. Mm -mm. Okay. Um, where does the, uh, why is this, um, uh, attacking uh, communities of color so hard versus other uh, communities, and both of you could respond at different times. Give me one second. I'm having trouble with Tamika. Give me one. Give me one second. I'm having trouble with my screen here. Can you go, Dr. Kell? I'm so sorry. I'm having trouble here. Okay, so I I think um, it's again nothing is ever one simple answer. So for, for many of us who have underlying diseases, so if you're diabetic or you have asthma, you're going to be a little bit more susceptible to this. But more than that, typically it is because of the jobs we do. So many of us have front-facing jobs. If you're in healthcare, this is the kind of job where you are going to be exposed to this more than other people. If you drive a bus, if you work in a grocery store, these are things that didn't stop happening with COVID. So you're exposed over and over and over again. And that tends to be the kinds of fields where you find a lot of people of color. This is what they call... Um, Essential workers. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. okay. Go ahead, uh, uh, Dr. Tamika. So we know that um, disparities have always existed um, in our community. Health disparities have always existed in our community. But COVID-19 seems to have put a spotlight 
on those disparities on the disparities. Um, okay, like when we talk about um, disparities, we're talking about those differences um, in, in health outcomes among populations. We're talking about that disease burden, the prevalence, the mortality rates of, of infection um, um, that's different between different um, communities. For example, um, even before COVID, we knew that um, uh, African Americans, you know, had a higher burden of hypertension and diabetes mm -hmm. um, uh, even before even before COVID. And we saw early on, um, and we probably could have predicted that poor people, minorities, would have a higher be disproportionately affected by um, COVID nineteen. Um, one thing that I do want to point out is that when we're talking about uh, COVID-19, um, we, we have to consider um, other, it, it's not just because we're Black that, you know, that we're being infected with, uh, with COVID-19. We have to think about it like in a, in a, in a broader social context, meaning mm -hmm. like we have to look at those social determinants um, of health, uh, such as your socioeconomic status, your health. Um, uh, your environment, pollution in your area, um, even down to transportation. All of these things have to be looked at in a broader context and, and just to know that uh, we're not, you know, just getting this uh, uh, vaccine, you know, th this virus disproportionately because, because we're Black. Um, and I was appalled, like months ago, I read an article like in a, in a, um, in a prominent medical journal um, that talked about COVID-19 and, and Black people being disproportionately affected simply because of our genetic makeup, right? I don't believe that that's true. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't believe that's true at all. Like, I don't think that, um, I don't believe that racism, I mean, I don't believe that your race causes you to be more susceptible. I think that racism has a part of you being uh, more susceptible. Um, because of those social determinants of health that haven't been uh, addressed. I think I saw that same article. I think it was very, if it was reviewed at all, it was very poorly reviewed. Yes. And they got fried yes. on social media. Yes. Hmm. Okay. Um, so what could what else could you tell us about um, uh, COVID nineteen? I mean, you you said it's not it's not like it's attacking us because we're African American or we're certain ethnicities, but it has a lot to do with the social context, the, the social context that you talked about, um, economic status, uh, pollution in our. Um, communities, transportation. Um, what did you mean by that? And if uh, Dr. Kim, you could uh, chime in anytime you want to, but how do you, how, um, just to break it down where people sure, sure. will um, understand and how would they uh, begin to advocate for themselves and their communities? Um. Well, when I when I think about those social determinants, like our, it's not just one one cause of the disparity. Um, it, it's it's not just because, um, uh, like Dr. Kim says, uh, we we're on the front lines, right? Like mm -hmm. we we are more exposed. Uh, a lot of people are more exposed in our community, and they're less protected, right? And it, it is not. And these things didn't happen just by happenstance. I don't think. I think these things. Um, uh, dates back to racial segregation um, and, and, and housing um, and just our communities. Um, so uh, I, I do believe that it's like, um, it, it's multifactorial, the, the reasons why we have these um, disparities. And uh, we need to address like those things such as um, transportation. Um, we knew early on, um, even with testing, like, you know, our community was behind in testing. Um, one, um, most of the places uh, require drive up testing, but what if you don't have a car, right? Um, most, a lot of places you need a prescription from your family doctor to get tested. Well, what if you don't have a family doctor? 
I see a lot of patients who use the emergency room as their primary care uh, physician. They don't have access to uh, a family doctor. So they don't, they couldn't, you know, access, you know, even testing um, back in, in, in March and April. Mm. Wow, thank you. Uh, anything you want to say, uh, Dr. Kim? It, the other thing is you have to think of not necessarily even those types of things, but at the beginning when testing was first made available, even at these drive up clinics, what if you can't stay all day? Some right. of those things, there are three or four hours. Now you're going to miss a day's work for this. You know, people are really not going to do that. That has nothing to do with race. It really is socioeconomic status. Right. Um, you know, there, I may have a good enough job that I could spend all day taking care of this, but not everybody has that. Mm -hmm. And I, and I also want to, I also want to point out that early on, and even now, there were a lot of wild theories out there uh, and misconceptions about the actual coronavirus, like who can get it and who can't get it. I mean, early on, we were hearing that Black people couldn't get the, vi couldn't get the virus at all. Um, so I, I don't know, like if early on, you know, like we took care and precaution to do those things as social distancing and wearing masks, like early on, because, you know, and I'm not, I'm not saying everyone, but, but there was like this wall conspiracy theory out there that black people just couldn't get coronavirus. I don't know where it came from, but I've heard that on several, uh, from several people. Mm -hmm. I actually can, it can help you trace that, but I think okay. it was clear that there were a lot of crazy theories out there. I saw all kinds of things. Like if you put hot water in your mouth and drink it real fast, you can't get it. Take 12 sips of water, all kinds of nonsense what kind of alkaline foods you should be eating right. to keep you from getting. We, I don't know if everybody, every community has these kinds of theories that go wild, but ours certainly does. <laughs> um, I think where the black people aren't going to get coronavirus thing came from was when it first became a pandemic and when it first be began to spread across the globe, out of China and everywhere else you didn't see a lot of cases in Africa. It wasn't because there weren't cases in Africa. It was because the laboratory capabilities in most of the continent had to be stood up. So okay. in the first four to five months, you didn't see cases because they didn't have testing. And so much like our last president, if you don't test, you won't have cases. Right. That's sort of where that came from. And obviously once several famous black Americans wound up with it. That one went by the wayside, thank God. Right. Mm -hmm. mm. Wow, let me see if we have any uh, questions. There is a uh, lot of comments, um, but yeah. So where, where, where do we go from here? We are the frontliners. We are the essential workers. We are the ones that, um, uh, with the transportation issue or may not have access to internet, what do we do? How do we um, advocate uh, for our family and other families in our larger community? I believe that we have to, uh, what we're doing tonight is, is a perfect example of education. I think that we have to uh, equip people, we have to empower people, um, and give them the resources, you know, to make a decision and not go on hearsay or, or theories or these myths that are floating around. I think that we definitely have to educate, um, educate people, you know, on the importance, you know, of the vaccine, of the importance of, uh, of, of clinical trials and, you know, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to say, Dr. Kim? I think you also have to marshal the forces that you have. So we have beauty shops, we have barber shops, we have churches. Wow. These are the places where this education needs to take place. Yes. You need to get the young people who are very tech savvy to go and, you know, get these appointments for their parents, grandparents, great aunties, great uncles. Um, I think you, you really have, this is the time when the community has to come together. Yes. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, it's, 
it's possible to do it without that, but it's much harder. Well, how do we do it in this um, atmosphere of COVID? Many of our churches, um, we're, we're not going to church. We're, we're having church on um, uh, in, uh, Zoom or we're having church where we call in or we're having church on Facebook, but we are not inside the building. How do we advocate? It was one thing when we were all together in the church and then the pastor would make an announcement. Well, what's happening now because we're not in the physical building. Um, we're not actually in the physical building of the barber shops or the beauty shops. And if we do go, there's one or two people at a time. How do we get this information out because it's one thing to see from the major um, uh, TV stations, but um, it's another thing to hear from people like you two, people that look like us. How do we get that information out? Well, if the pastor is still speaking, even on Facebook, he can still make that same announcement. Definitely. Um, uh, obviously, you know, we're not going to be gathered in the church basement like we used to, but we still have the ability to gather on Zoom, on Facebook, on social media, um, and you can clearly assign people to help a certain section of your church, just yeah. like you have the deacon who's responsible for this group of people within the congregation, you can have somebody who's responsible for the same group. Mm -hmm. Right. As Dr. Kim says, like we're, you know, we're all in this together, you know, so to speak, you know, so we have to, you know, rely on each other to, to, you know, to spread the information, you know, that, that, that we need, you know, using these social media platforms. I mean, it's an excellent, excellent way of, of spreading the information. Um, like she said, like, you know, we need you know, more pop-up areas. I think you said that, Reverend Sherry, more pop-up areas of vaccines, you know, things like that. You know, not just having uh, vaccines, you know, Philadelphia is proposing using um, the Wells Fargo Center um, for like mass vaccinations. I think that's a wonderful idea, but we can't forget about the people in the inner cities who do not have transportation to get to the Wells Fargo Center. And we mm -hmm. also have to keep in mind that if it's going to be at the Wells Fargo Center, who's going to get that vaccine, you know, when you're there? You know, what population, what group of pe people are going to be able to get that vaccine? You know, is it people from West Philly, North and South Philadelphia, or is it people from, you know, right across the bridge in South Jersey coming over to get a vaccine? Mm -hmm. That's why it's so important. Uh, for instance, I live here in Lancaster. So you're mentioning things that I really didn't think about because I mentioned earlier that um, they're going to open up the old Bonton Center at Park City. Park City is our mall. Um, so um, transportation, uh, maybe a bus. But then one of you mentioned, do you have all day to stay there? Uh, many have jobs. Um, so how are they going to stay all day, stand up all day, go in for a vaccine? Um, I believe they were saying the importance of um, CVS, uh, pharmacies, uh, Walgreens, mm -hmm. um, Rite Aids, uh, pharmacies that are local where um, people would not have to actually take a uh, Uber or whatever or a, or a bus. Um, the other thing I just want to say is, uh, Dr. Tamika, what did you do for the uh, youth group and for the um, extended uh, congregation? How did you advocate and share uh, your message about uh, COVID? Sure. Well, I was first asked by our youth director, um, um, uh, Brother Adam, who wanted to um, give information to our young people concerning the virus and different myths and misconceptions concerning the vaccine. Um, they had excellent questions, uh, you know, um, uh, as far as like, can you actually be uh, infected with the virus? Um, like, are, are you being injected with the actual coronavirus when you get the vaccine? You know, so I was happy and able to dispel, 
that myth that no, like you, you're not being injected with the coronavirus at all. It's it, it's a weakened, you know, uh, 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 it's not even, it's not a weakened or attenuated uh, vaccine like the ones that you know we're used used to. Um, it's a totally different platform, you know, than vaccines, you know, that that we that we're used to um, to uh, giving. So um, I did provide information to our youth, and then I was asked to come back on and and give more information to the general uh, church, like as a whole. And mm -hmm. I did get uh, text messages that people, you know, were happy that they received the information, that they did learn something um, from that um, that Zoom call. And they're able to take that information to their community, to their family, and to their friends. And that's the way that, you know, we're going to dispel, you know, these uh, myths, and, you know, and misconceptions, you know, by just spreading the information, um, the truth. Mm -hmm. So this is what I have to say to all, all of our listeners, uh, uh, particularly those ones that are in church leadership is to reach out to the people in your community that of uh, your local hospitals, healthcare centers, uh, call on them, ask them if they could do a Zoom meeting with your congregation. Please extend that to the overall community, invite your wives or your other um, agency people, um, invite your neighbors so that everybody could get the Zoom link and you could share information. I think that's the one, number one thing, particularly for our community is to dispel the myths because there are plenty of people, and this is why we have to advocate. There are plenty of people, our grandmothers, um, our grandfathers, our great grandparents that are not going to get this vaccine because of all the myths. One of the things which you said, Dr. Tamika, well, are they going to inject the virus in us? Would one of you speak on historically why we don't trust the healthcare field? Well, I think it's, it's important for us to, to I'm sorry, Dr. Kim. <laughs> Wait. I, I think it is important for us to first acknowledge that there is a distrust. Um, I mean, we've all heard of the Tuskegee uh, experiment, right? You know, where, you know, scientists wanted to study the uh, uh, progression of syphilis. And, and when there was a development of uh, uh, penicillin, it wasn't offered to those, to those uh, people who were in the trial. You know, so, you know Dr. Kim, if you correct me, but I believe penicillin was developed in, in 1951 um, or in 1950. And I believe that the test went on like into the 70s. Right, and these people weren't given that, you know, that that uh the the treatment, the penicillin, and also with Henrietta Lacks. I mean, we know that her cancer cells are still um, being cultured and used, like for other further research and studies. So mm -hmm. um, the distrust is deep, and we have to acknowledge acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to acknowledge it, but I also think that. At some point, what we have to stop doing is giving it credence. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. yes, it's true. The Tuskegee experimentation was horrible, and it ended in 1972. That was the last century. Mm -hmm. um, we have plenty of Black doctors, including one of the researchers who was responsible for one of the COVID-19 vaccines, is a Black woman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not a question that all of a sudden you know, it's, it's as bad as it was back in the, in the 1930s. No, it really mm -hmm. isn't. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing, you know, it, it's, it's important to seek out uh, reliable sources of information. And I think the guy who sold you your, his secondhand TV is probably <laughs> not a reliable source mm -hmm. of medical information. Mm -hmm. right. And so we have to be really careful about where we get this information. Exactly. If it something I saw on the internet that is almost always wrong. Okay. I I I, I want to uh, add add to that. You know, uh, we had some good things to come out of. I mean, this unfortunate uh, 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 trials and you know and things that happen experiments like now like there are guidelines, right? We have the IRB board, right? We have um, guidelines, you know, there, when it comes to a human trial. She means Institutional Review Board yes. as IRB. Thank you. 
that is how you set up studies. Exactly. We have, we have think that some good came out of this. You know, we have to get patient consent to able to be in study. They have to be given all the information before they make a decision to be in the study. So, I mean, so we do have something good to come out of that, you know, with the IRB, you know, International Review Board and things like that have been set up. Um, and, and I'm glad that Dr. Um, Kemp pointed out that Dr. I think Dr. Corbett, um, one of the lead scientists of the vaccine, you know, uh, she was at the forefront of developing the vaccine. I know that Dr. Grant, he's the uh, president of the American Nurses Association. It's 4.3 million registered nurses in this country. He's a black man and he was in the Moderna trial. Um, mm. There was a uh, I know I read that um, the presidents of the four black medical schools in the country, they were in the medical trials. So I think that we need to spread some of that information. Like she said, Dr. Corbett, who was the lead um, scientist on the vaccine uh, and also prominent um, black physicians um, who actually participated in these trials. I think that information needs to be put out there just as much as all the false information. I agree. Mm -hmm. Also, um, the president of the American um, Public Health Association, uh -huh. his name is Georges Benjamin, also a black man. So mm -hmm. it's not like everybody's just sitting around waiting for somebody <laughs> to do something to us. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. We're all involved. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, if, with our listeners, and um, how did you both get in these fields? I'll, I'll start with you, um, Dr. Kim. How did you get in your field? Well, um, I guess I learned about clinical laboratory science from our local community college. I can't remember what I was doing over there. It must have been a career fair or something that my mother dragged me to. And I've always, you can always tell if your kid is destined to be a scientist because they take everything apart. There's a lot of explosions. There are some explosions that happened in my house that my mother still doesn't know about. Um, so I was always interested in science at, at the beginning. Um, I liked working in the clinical laboratory. And if I had had a better shift, I might have stayed in it longer. But I was working a swing shift from second shift to third shift. I needed sleep. Mm -hmm. And also, I, I think um, my hat is off to those people who have a lot of direct patient care. So I would go and stick a child and go back to the lab and read their blood and realize they had leukemia and cry for half an hour. Uh, I just had to get out of that. So mm -hmm. I at one time at three o'clock in the morning when I was over some piece of instrumentation at Allentown General Hospital, I said, this is it. I'm going back to school. So I've always been interested in microbiology since I took my first course in micro in high school at Liberty in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Um, and so I, I wound up, my interest has always been in, in bacteria and how the differences can be shown between all the bacteria that you pass every day, all the time, and that never make you sick, and the ones that do make you sick. So my field is something called bacterial pathogenesis. It is all about how these bacteria can make you sick. The kinds that you've heard of, salmonella, E. coli, bordetella, vibrio cholera, that kind of bacteria is the kind of bacteria I always worked on. And so my first academic position, I was teaching microbiology to other clinical laboratory science students. Mm. Some shortly after that, I wound up working in policy and mostly what I worked on was clinical laboratory policy. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you. Doctor, uh, I'm going to go back to you also. I have some other questions, but um, Dr. Tamika, how did you get into your field? Well, I was a critical care registered nurse at Temple in the ICU. Uh, I worked in a respiratory care ICU for about 20, 21 years. Um, and I always knew that I wanted to uh, pursue a, a higher education um, beyond the bachelor's degree, but life happens and I had to continue, um, continue to work. And, and I did so in the intensive care unit for like I said, for about 21 years. And uh, I decided to go back to school. Um, a nurse practitioner appealed to me. Um, I knew that I can be a more autonomous um, practitioner. I knew that, you know, I could, um, 
uh, relate to my patients on a more profound level. I will have a, a more connection uh, with mm -hmm. patients. As a nurse practitioner, I'm able to diagnose uh, different, you know, diseases. I can treat patients. You know, I can order medications and and I just take care of patients like on on a different uh, level um, uh, using critical care uh, thinking skills. Um, as far as um, I also teach. Um, part time, I'm an adjunct instructor at Jefferson uh, School of Nursing on the graduate and undergraduate levels. Um, and I'm sort of thinking that that's my calling too, because I actually I absolutely love teaching, um, but I can't do it, you know, as much as I want to. Maybe later on, you know, I can, you know, do that full time. But right now, I work as a pulmonary nurse practitioner. Um, mm. I see um, patients. Um, in a pulmonary clinic, um, more so during a pandemic, I see patients in the hospital. Um, but um, I see patients with a myriad of pulmonary um, uh, uh, conditions, you know, COPD and asthma, that's the mainstay, all types of lung cancers, pulmonary sarcoid, pulmonary embolisms, less blood clots and things like that. Um, but when, um, when COVID hit um, last year, um, the COVID patients being a respiratory infection kind of fell into our <laughs> fell into our lap. So mm -hmm. um, we were kind of pulled from the office and was placed in the hospital. So for the last year, I've been seeing exclusively COVID patients um, mm -hmm. in the intensive care unit, um, as well as seeing some patients on the floor as well. Mm. Do you? Um... When you are seeing patients, or both of you, um, uh, well, Dr. Kim, I don't think you um, do patient care, but um, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Tamika, do you see the um, health disparities uh, when you're caring for your patients? You know, I, I can remember, I, I do, yes. Uh, in short, my answer is yes. Um, but um, I, I definitely can see, um, disparities when uh, I have uh, uh, patients of color, you know, come to the hospital. And by the time I see them in the intensive care unit, they tell me things like, you know, I've come, I came to the hospital to the emergency room twice. And, you know, and they sent me back home, you know, like, you know, I, I, I came, you know, I wanted to get tested for coronavirus, you know, I told them that I was having trouble breathing, and they told me to go home and monitor my symptoms. And then by the time they come back, you know, they're like in full blown, you know, uh, respiratory distress. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, yes, I have seen that disparity. I, I definitely see um, where um, I've had um, a patient who tell me that, you know, she was an essential worker. She worked in a store, right? Mm -hmm. But she lived in an apartment building, a small apartment building with a grandma, you know, and, and children. And they just don't have the real estate. They, they can't self uh, uh, quarantine. She had to go to work. You know, she had to go to work. And then what happens? You know, she contracted coronavirus, take it home. They don't have the space to isolate. So now we have families coming in with coronavirus. And I've seen that time and time again over the last year. So mm. it, it's definitely real. It's happening. Mm. Wow. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's, that's really, uh, real. Um, when they say quarantine, where do you quarantine? Uh, especially if you're living, uh, many of us live in, uh, multi-generational homes. Exactly. Um, so yes, a lot of the things, the guidelines that they talk about with the CDC, um, they look good on paper, but when you put them in communities, particularly communities of color, um, it doesn't make sense. So unless we have people like both of you and others um, to really advocate for us, we are left with um, really nothing, relying on the um, medical field, which um, at times continues to um, send us um, away when we're complaining mm. about certain illnesses. Well, one of the things that I want to um, say, just in case if we have any young people listening is that um, uh, Dr. Kim, you connected policy with medical. And I want you to speak to that. And then um, Dr. Tamika, you connected law with medical. 
Um, and so you brought in both of these disciplines um, into your into your uh, career. Dr. Kim, could you address that? And I'm going to look and see if there's any questions. Um, well, one of one of the things you said was, OK, people live in multi generational homes. Um, we're not getting the the attention when we do show up for care. And I think, you know, the the real issue here is sure there's medical racism, but what is missing is the not only advocating, but to have someone sitting at the table when these policies are passed who can mm -hmm. say, yes, this works very well if you are a middle-class family in a single family mm -hmm. home and you can send your, your infected person to the basement. Right. If you watch CNN, we see that that's exactly what happened to Chris Cuomo. Right. He got it. He had to move into right. the basement away from his family. I live in a two bedroom apartment. If somebody were here with me, uh, I don't know how much quarantining we could do. There's still only one kitchen, you know, um, and and if you're living in a multi generational household that that's going to be impossible. You're going right. to put grandma in the attic if you even have an attic right now, you know, so I, I think. The thing is that you have to be at the table and it is important that you fight to be at the table. Most of the time when policy gets made, this is this is what I did for 10 years. Most of the time when policy gets made, there are always a lot of different kinds of people who sit there. So if we're looking at a specific kind of the say the, the COVID test, you need people who work in the laboratories. You need people who can figure out how to get the samples from the patient to the laboratory. You need somebody who's gonna figure out how much this is going to cost and where we're gonna get the money for this. You need the patient advocate who says, well, I can't get my granny to this place for the test. So we need somebody who can figure out how to do that. That's mm -hmm. what policy is. That's what people mm -hmm. never watch because that is the sausage being made. Nobody wants to see that. In this case, in, in this pandemic, the sausage making has been very public. And that's part of the reason why everybody is so confused. Mm -hmm. Normally this takes place, you go to the, whatever the FDA or the CDC or whatever it is, you have your, the people who work at the agency. So the CDC or FDA employees, but then you also have a crackerjack group of people who say it's the head of infectious disease at Harvard, or it's the head of um, epidemiology at, at uh, UCLA, those people all gather together and they hammer it out. And mm -hmm. that's not pretty and it's hard work, but usually you come out with something that works. However, if there's a big hole, like we need somebody from the working class community who is not at this table, you're gonna miss all the stuff that's important for that group. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes across industries. I see that uh, early on in the pandemic, when it, you know, when it, even if in nursing and housekeeping, you know, I saw, you know, people, you know, that look like me who would come to deliver trays, people who look like me came to empty out the trash, right? And they were told that they can just wear surgical masks. Well, we're in a full blown pandemic, right? But at the table, you have people making policies to say that this will suffice like this is this will be okay if you're in the room less than five minutes then you're okay well, what kind of policy is that like would you go in that room you know mm -hmm. with with a surgical mask with someone coughing like in full-blown COVID-19 like no but like we need more people um mm -hmm. at the table like Dr. Kim says you know mm -hmm. because little people are being hurt you know um, housekeeping, the kitchen workers, you know, like nurses, um, the ancillary staff, you know, do not have always have a voice at the table making these decisions. Mm. Wow, that's a really, oh, that's really good. Uh, question, do the doctors recommend any particular vaccine over the other? Well, right now we just have the mRNA vaccine, uh, Moderna and Pfizer. Um, I do believe that Johnson & Johnson has applied um, for the yeah. emergency use authorization. I don't think it has been approved yet, Dr. Kim. It has um, not been. I don't think the meeting happens until 
what's today's date? The 18th. I think the meeting doesn't happen until the 24th or the 25th or something like that. Okay. Um, elderly. But the answer is take whatever vaccine you can get. Right. Right. Whatever right. you can get, that's what you take. Exactly. Okay. Elderly people need a support system, someone who can take them with a wheelchair. If it's a, a long wait, even with the appointment, it can take more than an hour to move through the line. This was not a question, but just um, a comment um, that someone had. So yes, I just want to thank you. We have about a couple more minutes, um, but any, any, um, Thing else that you would like to say, uh, Dr. Kim, Dr. Um, Tamika? I'm hopeful. I, I'm hopeful that, you know, as more um, people are vaccinated, as more people um, uh, get, you know, proper, uh, truthful information, um, I do believe, uh, I do believe that, you know, the vaccine, I mean, the virus, you know, will come to an end. I, um, I believe that God himself can actually stop the vaccine, you know, stop this virus spread. But um, until then, until he decides to do that, I do see um, a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, our numbers in the hospital are going down um, every, every week. I mean, we're seeing less and less patients, you know, come to the hospital. Um, so I'm hopeful, you know, that um, our cases will go down and we'll reach that uh, that herd immunity, you know, where I guess 70 to 80% of our population have been vaccinated. Um, and then, you know, we can somewhat get back to some of a normal life, if, you know, if that's a such thing. But um, I am hopeful that, you know, uh, we will turn, I don't want to say turn the page or turn the corner. Either. I remember hearing that over the last year from Donald Trump. I don't want to say turn the <laughs> but, um, but I do see a light at the end of the tunnel. The light at the end of the tunnel. That's good. Dr. Kim. I would say, you know, notwithstanding all those that we have lost, yeah. scientifically, this has been a major step forward. Um, let's put it this way. I get a flu vaccine every year. It is typically maybe 60% effective. <laughs> and we have a 100 year head start. So we knew about influenza in 1918. Mm -hmm. In the last year, we've gone from, it was an atypical pneumonia found in some province in China to we know what the virus is. We've isolated the virus. We know what the uh, immunologically active protein is. And we have not one, but two vaccines that it's we amazing. can go with. In this country, there are a number of other vaccines. My, my best friend lives in Brazil. He got his shot. It was a regular platform kind of vaccine. It wasn't even an RNA. So all around the world, in basically less than a year, we've got something. Yes. I think our biggest problem has been logistics. And I think, you know, with the change in administration, we've gotten much better at it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anything so you can... Anything you could say about the mutations or the variants that we're hearing so much on TV? Sure, I can handle that one. Um, so <laughs> viruses always mutate. RNA viruses always mutate. So it's not that the virus mutates to hurt you. It's just that each one of these mutations, if it, if it gets passed on, it is because it gives a survival advantage so think about giraffes all the food is at the top of the tree if you have a long neck you can get to the food you live long enough to reproduce you don't get a long neck because the food is up there but the animals with the longest necks live long enough to produce cubs they mm -hmm. make babies the same thing happens with viruses in that there are lots and lots and lots of mutations. And if all we did was look for mutations, we spend all our money looking right. for mutations. Right. So the whole RNA, every single one of those nucleotides could be replaced more or less. The ones that will kill off the virus, well, we won't ever see those mutations because the virus will never jump from person to person. The ones that allow the virus to be more efficient are the ones that we're gonna catch. And so that's why we're seeing these new mutants. Oh, it, 
it uh, they're more infectious well yeah that's a survival advantage for the virus so every mutant is not a bad thing but the ones that confer the survival advantage may very well be mm. okay all right i just want to ask i i think you said a couple times rna <laughs> what what is that um so that's a type of nucleic acid all of us have RNAs. Um, we also have DNA. For a virus, it never has both kinds. It has one or the other. So coronaviruses are RNA viruses. So they only have RNA. So the, the, grand, the grand triangle in, in um, growth and in mammalian cells is DNA is the library. RNA is the translation and then protein is the thing that builds you up. All right. So we always have RNA in our bodies. We always have DNA. We always have protein. For the, the virus, it has one nucleic acid or the other. It's a DNA virus or it's an RNA virus. This virus in particular is not only an RNA virus, but it's the message that goes from, basically that would go from DNA to protein. So as soon as this RNA hits your cells, it is able to make all the proteins it needs to package itself and attack the next cell. Mm -hmm. So positive polarity mRNA viruses are the fastest ones because they don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. Once they're in, they can start working. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you. As I said in the beginning of our show, we have two phenomenal, um, highly intelligent women. Uh, true uh, transparency, uh, Dr. Kimberly Walker. I've known her um, all her life. We grew up in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, went to St. Paul Baptist Church together. And um, also, um, uh, Dr. Armwood, Tamika Armwood, we go to the same church, Beloved St. John Evangelistic Church in Philadelphia. So I pulled my resources, and what I'm saying to you is pull your resources, bring your resources together, put together a Zoom meeting and get the information out to your community. We may not be in the physical building, but we could still communicate of what's going on. We need to know, um, you know, how do we transport um, our loved ones? How long is it going to uh, take us? Who are the contact people at LGH? How do we um, sign up? If we have resistance, we should be able to contact our loved ones' doctors so that they could talk to them. We could give them information. You could bring it up right on your phone. If your loved ones are resistant, at least give them the information so that they have knowledge and they could determine it from there. Not pushing the vaccine, I'm pushing knowledge. So I just want to thank you. I'm going to give you the last word. Um, I just want to mention our sponsors that support us. Uh, we have the first one is Legal Shield, Kimberly Robinson. She believes we can all agree that everyone deserves equal justice in this country. She has made it her personal mission to share these services. Legal Shield is unlimited consultation. Legal Shield is letters and phone calls. You get your own uh, lawyer, your document view. They can review your contracts, personal legal contracts estate planning, traffic, speeding tickets, uh, loss of driver's license, medical directive, protect your rights as they relate to your health care issues. They are available 24 seven. Someone will call you within four hours. They also have different memberships, preferred member discount, member perks. They also protect your entire family identity theft, um, credit bureau. Uh, monitoring. So they have an array of services for you. She again says everyone deserves equal justice in this country. She made it her personal mission to share these uh, services. You can reach her at Kimberly Robinson. We are legal shield.com or Kimberly Robinson 123 
84 at gmail.com. Uh, also, we have WLAB 107 Gospel Radio, The Rev, which was started uh, October of uh, 2019 by Reverend Dr. Lewis A. Butcher, retired pastor from Brightside Baptist Church here in Lancaster. His goal is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ through music, preaching, and teaching, as well as to bring light to a community issue through internet radio station. WLAB broadcasts 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The website for the station is WLAB107.com, and you can get this on Facebook page, WLAB107. The intention of the station is to provide a variety of music, including traditional contemporary gospel quartet, uh, gospel jazz and hymns. The station also presents dynamic preaching, teaching, and podcasts. I must also say that I'm on WLAB uh, along with Minister, uh, uh, Minister Ladson, Reverend White, and Stallings, and we are called Logos Masterclass. We have Erica Dennison Mack. Uh, paparazzi. God bless you, Erica Dennison Mack. She uh, is down in Texas. She lives there, so we're just praying that all is well with her. She sells paparazzi accessories are always fabulous, always fashionable, and always $5 with new styles added daily. You can shop anytime to look like a million. She says that this is all made of nickel and lead free. Not only does she sell beautiful jewelry, God bless her, but she, for her uh, extra income, but she also makes it her story and she uh, reaches out to people to tell them about Jesus Christ. You could reach her at www.livelaughshineaccessories.com or email her at livelaughshine116 at gmail.com. Last, we have Elizabeth Guthridge, which is the founder and financial wellness consultant of EAG Credit Solutions, LLC. EAG Credit Solutions help men and women manifest their legacies by exposing them to financial literacy using credit restoration as a starting point. She will maximize your credit score by removing any inaccurate, erroneous, and obsolete information on your credit file. She will help you with collections, judgments, repossessions, medical bills, and late payments. She works with individuals, couples, families, realtors, bankers, and car dealership, and more. Her services include teaching you how to budget, building and repairing your credit, uh, a will, a trust, power of attorney, identity, and credit monitoring. She will even have a credit attorney to handle your legal issues. Contact Elizabeth Guthridge, 717-715-3979, or email her at liz at eagcreditsolutions.com. Tell her that we sent you, and she'll give you a free 15 minute consultation. So ladies, I just want to say to you, uh, any last word that you have? I just want to thank you for having me um, as a guest tonight. Um, I do want to say that I am a proponent of vaccines. Um, so I echo what Dr. Kim said earlier, you know, if you are afforded the chance to get the vaccine, whatever, whichever one, Moderna or Pfizer, I do um, encourage you to do so. If you want more information on either vaccine, you can easily um, go to Moderna or Pfizer's website. When the Johnson & Johnson website come out, if you need more breakdown of you know, information about any of these vaccines, you definitely can go onto their um, websites. Um, and, and the reading is not difficult. It's not, it's not like really dense information, um, the way they have broken it down for the public. Um, so I do encourage you to go on to those websites and get the information that you need and also speak to your trusted um, healthcare provider to get more information. Yes, that's very important. I, Dr. Kim. Also, there are two other sites you can go to. You can go to your local health department, wherever mm -hmm. you live, 
And the other place you can always go for information is the CDC's website, which is very easy to remember, cdc.gov, cdc.gov. Always a good place to go. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you for listening to Reset with Reverend Sherry on TCP Network. Uh, our upcoming shows are uh, this Thursday, February 25th at 5 o'clock. What does God say about being single? Single Christians, we are going to have a discussion in March 11th and 25th uh, in March at 5 o'clock. Women's Month of Entrepreneurship, Creating a New Enterprise for Both Men and Women. So thank you so much, Dr. Kim. Uh, Walker and Dr. Uh, Tamika Armwood, I just want to thank you. God bless you all. Um, you are doing um, great work for us. And thank you for coming on here and sharing with our um, listeners. I um, definitely feel informed um, that I have more uh, information and um, I believe in each one, teach one. So uh, if there's anybody out there and you um, just hit me up on Facebook or ask me any questions, and if I can't answer it, I, I have two sister doctors, friends now. So, hey, I am enriched. God bless you all. Thank you for listening to TCP Reset with Reverend Sherry. God bless you. Thank Good you. Good night. Good night. Yes, go ahead. <laughs>